a 3D printer controller board is super interesting because you can use it to control motors, or heaters, read temperatures, and all in the real time. So it is very useful to know a little bit more about how it works as you never know, maybe you will need something like this in your own projects. To learn more, I had a call with Elias, who designed one of these controller boards. I recorded our call and that's what you will see in this video. We will talk about hardware, uh, software, testing, assembly, and Kickstarter projects. I really hope you will find this video interesting and useful. Here it is. Here is my call with Elias. So I always wanted to know how these 3D printers controller board work. So yep. let's have a look. Well, now's your chance. So this is a connection diagram that sort of uses all the, um, all the ports, all the connectors. And um, what you can see is you have six stepper motors. Usually in a 3D printer, you have X, Y, C axis, right? But more modern 3D printers, they have more complex geometries. Um, so you have multiple um, steppers for for doing bed leveling, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. So most controller boards will have more than four uh, stepper drivers. Mm -hmm. So basically you... You design your board more generic, so uh, it can be used even for more complex 3D printers, correct? But for yeah. like basic 3D printer, you would only use like three motors. Four. Four. XYZ plus extruder. Ah, okay. Ex yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, because you need to push the mm, filling. Filament. The filament. Filament, oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's X, Y, Z, E. Um, but, you know, some printers will have two two motors for the Z axis, for instance, like one on each side. Or um, uh, if you have, um, imagine that you have um, a bed that can be leveled. So it can sort of uh, be a plane that you can control. Then you can have three motors to um, give it like that, that whole space. But I, I haven't seen printer like that. Rat rig is one example of one that has a stiff bed and then it has three points to do bed, uh, calibration or bed trimming. I do. I have the calibrator, but I only have the sensor and then uh, basically the sensor is touching the bed and I guess the software will kind of calculate the position of the bed and will correct probably all the data which are going out to the motors. I don't know exactly how it worked, but that's what I guess. Yes. But that's like software bed leveling. That's not like exactly. real bed leveling. No, exactly. That's when you, you do the, the trimming in, in software. So you compensate in software mm -hmm. for a, a bed that is slanted or at an angle. I think we should mention to everyone who doesn't know exactly what we are talking about is like uh, the place where the 3D printing uh, starts uh, has to be like super flat because if it's not super flat, then uh, the basically the the extruder or the tip of the things where the filament is going out has to be very, very close to this uh, bed and if it's not very close then the filament is not going to for example stick uh, very well or it can like maybe even damage the extruder or something if it's a little bit up so it has to be very precise otherwise printing is not good and that's why this bed leveling is like super important yeah so it needs to be at the right distance over a large area exactly yeah. so, same distance yeah so that's why you do, and there's a lot of different solutions to this. There's a lot of different solutions to this. Um, but one big difference, I guess, is, um, is to do a software compensation versus a bed, uh, like a physical compensation. Mm -hmm. 
where in one instance you fix it in software and the other you uh, you compensate by actually moving the bed mm -hmm. or like the frame that goes up. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. understand. And I think that uh, if you can fix it in hardware, that is a better uh, because um, it's then you probably actually... more accurate, I guess, because you may be losing accuracy if you are adjusting this uh, in software. I don't know. Yeah, you can be. There, there are some 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 uh, some negatives uh, with doing it in software. Okay. Okay. So there are four motors plus two extra. What else do we have there? What else? Um, well, you need to keep things cool. Like mm -hmm. you need to keep the hot and hot and the cold and cold. Um, so in this diagram, there's three extruders mm -hmm. and you see that it has like a maybe a 40 watt uh, heating element or something mm -hmm. like that so extruder again we, we i think we should explain extruder is the head where the filament or the plastic is going out yes well i guess technically this is the hot end so yeah. it's just yeah but the extruder is uh, including the thing that pushes the filament oh yeah okay yeah i think usually people say it like that okay and um, uh, so it's uh, you say how many watts? 40? 40 watts, something like that. So it's not that high. Okay. But this bed is usually uh, a pretty high current draw. Okay. So again, I think we should explain. This is the bed. And when using a like, specific type of filament, you may need to heat it up to uh, specific temperature so this uh, thing what you are printing out is going to stick to this bed so yep. we need to heat it up uh, and uh, depends on the filament that you're using and it depends on the, the the surface that you're printing on as well it depends on several things but usually it's nice to be able to heat up the uh, the bed and then once it cools down it it will pop off yeah print. that's what i really like my very first 3d printer it didn't do it this way and i spent so much time trying to put it like away from the bed it was <laughs> it was really bad but yeah the yeah. now i have the creality and their pro mm -hmm. and basically i think uh, i'm using uh, 90 degrees to for uh, P E T G or something. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it sticks very well. And when it cools down to I don't know thirty degrees, mm -hmm. you just take it and it's just yeah. it's it doesn't stick anymore. So it's like super cool. That is nice. There's been some improvements there in three D printing. I don't know how they do it. It's like some kind of I think there is some kind of special surface on it and and it yeah. probably shrinks or something. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I'm not really an expert on that, uh, mm -hmm. but um, PEI, I think it is, is a pretty popular um, surface material to have on the bed. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's um, yeah, there's different coatings that you can have, but usually it's in combination with some kind of uh, heater. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh. Yeah. Okay, and this bed and also the uh, extruders they have or. Extruders, correct. They have the temperature sensors or something like that. I see. Exactly. Green wire yep. as well. They have different temperature sensors, and like usually it's um, it's just a thermistor. Mm -hmm. It can also be a thermocouple or a, a PT100 or PT1000, um, which is um, platinum type of probe. <laughs> How good or how accurate is this uh, temperature feedback from the bed? Because well, that's a good that's a good question. I, I made a video about that. <laughs> oh, from the bed, you mean specifically? Yeah, from the bed. It depends, because I think it's quite big. So I guess yeah. the temperature will be different in different places. It does, but it depends on the bed. Um, so if you have a, a big aluminum uh, bed. With then a, heat will be heat. distributed like yeah, it should be distributed pretty pretty well and it's not that critical like uh the accuracy uh of the 
the accuracy exactly on the bed is more critical on the hot end, as far as I understand. Okay, so uh, and the extruders, how how accurate are these? Because it specifically says like when you are using specific filament, it says like use two hundred thirty five degrees. So I think it needs to be very accurate. I think that. Uh, is probably not that accurate, but it's um, hmm. what is the what is Re the, rela the relatively accurate? <laughs> yeah. So um, I think most uh, printers will differ quite a bit from the absolute temperature, um, but you can tune it to your specific needs. So mm -hmm. if you if you have one printer that you're using a lot, then you can tu uh, and you you know the filament and you know like all the parameters, then you can tune it a little bit up or down five mm -hmm. degrees, something like that. And it's also pretty forgiving when it mm -hmm. comes to uh, print okay. temperatures because there's also a lot of other factors that matters. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah. there are like two heating elements in this uh, bed because I see there are four wires, four red wires going there. It's four wires, but that's only to distribute the current a little bit. Okay. So, yeah. so the connectors that I'm using, they can handle 15 amps per pin. <sighs> That's the specification from the manufacturer. Um, and uh, if you want to have a, like a, a 20 amp bed, then you need more pins basically. Mm -hmm. But uh, once you get into the bigger printers, usually they don't have the current going directly through it. They usually have uh, an SSR and a um, like a, a 220 volt uh, heating element or 100. Mm -hmm. Any, any amount. Hmm. Okay, then there is power supply, I see. Yep. Power and, supply. Yeah. And, um, and uh, switches. So these are yeah. to specify the uh, beginning and end, I guess. You, you can use it. Usually you just have the beginning, so you have like a zero point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these are stepper motors, so they run in open loop, except that they do a homing once and then they know the position and then they do everything based on that, right? And homing is uh, the X1, Y1, Z1. How big is it? What do you mean? What is the homing doing? Yeah, you sort of just run the stepper motors up until you hit something. Mm -hmm. And that can be... Uh, X1, Y1, Z1. Mm -hmm. And that's one way to do homing. And then you move away from it. And then you, because it's stepper motors, you, you always know exactly where you are based on just the number of the, steps uh, yeah. you used. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no also... protection for the other end? You can have it. You can have it. But it's actually a little bit un unusual. It is unusual to have it. Because um, what are you going to do if you hit the other end? <laughs> what you are you going to do? Stop. Yeah, <laughs> you should stop. Yeah, but um, in practice, it's very rare that yeah, you sort of hit the other end by mistake. It just mm -hmm. doesn't happen. Okay. Do you have end stops on the other end on your printer? Sorry. Do you have end stops on the opposing end of your printer? No. <laughs> no. I don't think it's that um, common. I think it's unusual. Okay. And there's also a way to detect if you have skipped any steps. Um, so if the, mo if the stepper motor sort of um, skips a step, then there are ways to detect that as well, which is built into the stepper driver. How can it skip a step? Well, if there's... Well, if you take a, a stepper motor and you have a wrench and you, <laughs> you sort of force it mm -hmm. or if you hold it back somehow. So if you if it's physically hindered, then you can skip a step. How can you detect this? You use the back EMF and then you measure that somehow. Uh, and um, I think they actually look at the uh, current draw. Mm-hmm. 
And then they, they have something called stall detection, which is built into the, the Trinamic drivers. Um, and then they can, if that sort of goes over a limit that you have set, then you can detect that. You get an interrupt. So basically what you are saying, if your printer is printing and you move the head, yes. then it will detect you move the head and it will also know how many steps did you move it? Not, uh, I don't think so, but you can detect that something is wrong and mm -hmm. then you can do sort of a, a homing routine mm -hmm. and then you come back to where you had the problem. That's interesting to know because, uh, you know, a couple of times I was thinking like, for example, I was cleaning the bed when it was moving or something and I was like, oh, when I touch it like too much, is it going to like detect that I move the motors or something? Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yep. So there are the switches and... Uh, oh, we didn't uh, talk about the fans. So how the fans are used? I know well, there is one on extruder, maybe? Yes, on the on the hot end, on like the cold side of the hot end. Mm -hmm. So this part is hot and then this should be kept cold. And mm -hmm. there's a fan there. Um, but then it's also nice to have a fan just blowing on the print. Mm -hmm. And then it might be nice to have a fan on the board. Um, yeah, so you have different places. It's nice to have a lot of fans. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. So you need to cool down the other end of the uh, filament so it's not melting all the way, just at the tip. Yeah, so this part should be kept cold and this part should be kept warm. Mm -hmm. So, and you should ideally have a short transition there so that um, the transition from hot to cold is short. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. But I'm not, a, I'm not an expert when it comes to like the material science and, the, and the, the, all that stuff. That's sort of, that's, it's not electronics related. So I just, I just make the electronics and the software. <laughs> No, it's interesting because, uh, you know, for example, sometimes happen, the extruder will uh, get stuck. And yes. I guess it's exactly, it, it will happen, for example, when uh, the filament will uh, cool down somewhere in the extruder yes. and it just doesn't push anymore properly. So I guess they had to think through these kind of problems and maybe this is one of the things what is helping like fans and all this stuff i don't know yeah uh, so there's definitely a need to have like um the cold end should be kept at a reasonably low temperature mm. heat sort of creeps up the uh, to the cold side then the filament will get stuck there mm -hmm. or up then it should be so it should be sort of when it hits the melt zone the the part where in the, then in it the, has to uh, go out immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if heat creeps up, so if you, if the fan stops for some reason, or if it becomes too warm there, then, then it will get stuck higher up there and that can cause a clog, which is not ideal. Exactly. And then once you print it, maybe you would like to cool it down very, or faster. So it actually sticks there. That's one of the other fans for, yeah, correct. Uh, I, yes. So as soon as the, the, the filament has left the nozzle, then you want to cool it down. It depends on the, the, the material filament, again. Yeah. Yeah. The filament. Yeah. But, um, most, most of the time you want to cool it, uh, fairly rapidly mm -hmm. so that okay. you can have overhangs and, uh, you can print at an angle or yeah, print overhangs basically. And then you have monitor and touch screen, I see. Yeah, so this is one of the things that's special about this. So when you have like a Linux-based board, you can have something like a touch screen. A nice GUI. A nice GUI, yeah. So that's, you can also do that with a microcontroller, but it becomes very crude, it becomes very simple. Mm -hmm. Make something that is responsive and uh, gives a nice user experience, basically. So this is very interesting because you said you are running a Linux operating system. 
and I guess all this should be some kind of real time processing stuff, correct? Yeah. So that's um, that's one of the things that I think is a little bit novel about this. Um, is that it uses so in order to do real time motor control using a regular Linux, then you need something. You need there's several ways to do it. Like you can, if you want to do um, real time something, <laughs> then you can use a microcontroller that's mm -hmm. very real time out of the box. But with a microcontroller, you it's difficult to get Wi-Fi and ethernet and all of that stuff. Um, so what you can do is you can use some kind of real time operating system like FreeRTOS or Zephyr. Um, I'm, I'm not really an expert in that, but I just know that those are real hard, real time operating systems. Uh, I would like to say if someone would like to know about these, uh, leave comments because actually I was talking to Martin, I think, uh, last week, and he's really good in this, uh, real time operating system. So if uh, people would like to create me a video about this, then leave comments. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to learn about it as well. It's actually, it's a little bit different as I was expecting. So that's, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> Yep. Um, there's also another way to do it. If you want to use Linux, there's uh, like the real time Linux um, where you can have the, a kernel with real time capabilities. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say the Zephyr is a real time operating system for microcontroller, actually not for like a Linux operating system. Yep. Correct? Correct. Yeah. Yep. But high end microcontrollers, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and the fourth option I've mentioned here is to, I've, I've got a spelling mistake here, <laughs> is to use um, a regular Linux kernel and then have some kind of different CPU that does mm -hmm. the yeah. real-time stuff. So which one you are using? I'm using the final one. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, so you somehow send the um, commands or something what should be happening, you send it to the microcontroller and microcontroller is handling this real-time stuff. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So all the rage these days is um, uh, an uh, like a controller software for 3D printers called Clipper. Mm -hmm. They have, um, there's a separation between like the calculations of uh, the the paths and everything like the 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 step uh, and direction generation it follows like um it's like all the physics involved can we find it on uh, in google mm -hmm. so this is for microcontrollers correct yeah exactly let's see if there's um something maybe in features Mm -hmm. So the concept is that you have something uh, like a, a single board computer plus something else which handles the real time. Mm -hmm. For instance, a Raspberry Pi with an Arduino-based microcontroller mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and then you do all the calculations on the fast... Um, uh, single board computer mm -hmm. and then you just send like the low level stuff to the the hard real time microcontroller mm -hmm. and um, then the microcontroller doesn't need to do any calculations or anything so it can be very yeah, it can be just do what it needs to do so the, it does something way. like uh, move it to this x and y position and that's it yeah it becomes sort of like a, um, an advanced DMA, if you know what I mean. No. So, you, <laughs> um, so um, let me let me see what is the uh, what is the alternative. The alternative is to have like a microcontroller that 
understands G codes. Yes. Um, yep. Yeah. And then it needs to interpret how, uh, like it needs to interpret the G code and it needs to s calculate a path from one position to another. Okay, we should explain maybe what G code means. So basically, G code is telling. Uh, there are, I think, a couple of different commands, but you may have command like move the uh, extruder to this position, and then there may be command like move it. I don't know how many steps to left. I don't remember exactly how it is done, but I think that's kind of. There's a lot of there's a lot of different G codes, um, and uh, it, there's not really a good standard for it even, uh, but. Um, the main G code is move from this position to this other position mm -hmm. um, with an acceleration curve. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously, you know, you know, uh, all the, all the steps that you're going to take. So you can cache a lot. You can pre pre calculate it mm -hmm. way. And you can do that on a, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you can do that. You can cache quite a bit without, uh, doesn't really matter. Yeah, it needs to not stop in between the different path segments, basically. Mm -hmm. You have a bunch of path segments, uh, which is what the G-code does. It sort of says move from X, Y, uh, X, Y, Z position to another X, Y, Z position um, in this time and with this acceleration. Um, and then once you reach that position, then you move to the next position. And that's basically all that happens. There's a little bit of maintenance in terms of temperatures you can set the temperature and you can do other things like probe the bed all of that stuff but it's it's the it's the movement that is the the bulk of what what is mm -hmm. going on yeah. and so that path planning that needs to happen in real time otherwise you're going to have a printer stopping and you don't mm -hmm. want that okay okay i understand um, so there is some kind of protocol between the microcontroller and the uh, board which is calculating and, and preparing all this data for the microcontroller, correct? Yeah, so... So you need Clipper on the microcontroller, but also you need something on the other side? Yeah, so Clipper is distributed in that it both runs on the um, single board computer and on the microcontroller. So it so has two parts? Yes, it has two parts. And it sort of has a protocol between it, which is not G-code, but it's a more low-level protocol. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more finished calculations. Mm -hmm. if you want. Yeah. It's nice to know that someone actually created this so you don't have to create everything from scratch. Yeah, and that's the great thing about Clipper. There's a lot of different um, uh, printers and boards that support it so that um, it's nice to sort of contribute to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But do you still need to use specific chips which are supported by Clipper, correct? Well, when I was making Recore, then there was no support for the solution that I had chosen because it's it's different than um, what was already there. But I've uh, I've uh, started to submit uh, like a patch. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that will be accepted. Mm -hmm. Let me just see if I can get this uh, thing back here. So this was a, a a big video that I created a while ago, and it is a little bit special because it doesn't have a, a separate microcontroller, which is external. It uses um, a microcontroller on the system on chip. And this oh, is- Oh, so you are not using external microcontroller for this? Not for this. Okay. Well, I'm not using it for the real time stuff. So. Um, I do have a separate microcontroller, but it's like a very cheap, a very simple microcontroller that only does the ADC and PWM the stuff. The temperature and monitoring and yeah. all. So it doesn't have anything to do with the motors. So the motor control microcontroller is actually part of your processor. Yes, it's on the system on chip processor. Okay, so let's have a look how you did this. <laughs> yeah, so the the concept is that most system on chips they will have some kind of extra core uh on there and it's not the main core but it's some other core and 
usually if the system on chip is meant to be used in a phone or a tablet or something like that, then this uh, other core, it does some maintenance when the phone is off or mm -hmm. in mode, basically. So if you have, imagine that you have a, a regular phone and then you, you uh, disable the screen or you, you like put it in sleep mode, which is most of the time, right? Then you want to disable the screen. You want to disable the memory, maybe, or you want to disable quite a bit of the the whole phone, and you want to spend as little battery as possible. Um, that's the main purpose of this other core. A three D printer doesn't really need to go into sleep mode mm -hmm. um, in the same way. So, what I'm doing is I'm using that CPU to do the hard real time control the motor control that's like i think mm, that's very interesting that you went actually this way because there are not like many people who would try to discover new <laughs> new ways of doing things usually people just go with something what was already done yep yeah it was um, a bit of a gamble but I had, uh, I think when this was in 2019, in August in 2019, and when I Googled for the same problem, I, I you know, I Googled uh, A64 or something like that and uh, real time. And then there was one blog post or uh, just a, a forum post about somebody asking, is it possible to use this for something else like real time? And then somebody had answered, yeah, probably, it would probably be fine. Uh, but then since then, I've seen other implementations and I, I've seen that uh, some CNC machines uh, and stuff uh, are using the same uh, concept that mm -hmm. I'm using. So it's good to see that other people are doing the same thing. That means the idea is good, you know? Good. Well done. <laughs> okay. What else do you have on your pictures? What else do I have? Are you interested in testing jigs? Uh... Oh yeah. Okay. So you created your own testing jig to actually test the board, what you designed, correct? Yeah. So because it's such a complex board, I wanted to do a, a thorough testing of everything. And, um, like, how do you test, um, a stepper motor to make sure that it's working or a stepper motor driver to make sure that it's working? And so I, um, I created this board and here's an attempt at, uh, uh embedded, uh, uh, stepper motors. <laughs> Have you seen this before? No, it didn't work. <laughs> but oh, I was but uh, are these like, uh, coils or something? PC yes, coils? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm actually working on a video with Carl. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've watched uh, a lot of his videos. And uh, I, I'm already processing the video. It will be uh, going out very soon. And he right. has done a lot of work uh, with yeah. this. And he actually designed a robot with like PCB uh, motor, PCB motor. Yep. That's yeah. very interesting. I think that um, the reason uh, it's not working here, but it is working sort of in general is that, uh, because I want to test standard off the shelf, um, stepper motor drivers, right. And they, they do, they have certain assumptions about the stepper motor, for instance, the resistance mm -hmm. and the amount of, uh, uh, flux in the coils and all of that. Um, and my, I've done two attempts at uh, getting this to work. And I think that in the final version, I, um, I was able to get, um, some kind of, uh, uh activity, but <laughs> you really have to, uh, pay attention when designing the, the, the layout because the coils need to be in a certain manner and they need to sort of have the same it needs to be a, a stepper motor basically mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to go around <laughs> so in in this case i uh, i think i uh, ended up with um using real stepper motors 
Yes. Right. So you see, I have a backup here. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So that goes to uh, looking at this picture again. It goes to some um, some regular stepper motors, mm -hmm. um, which with some wires. It's not so fancy, but uh, at least it it does the the job. And so it's basically six stepper motors that has an end stop, so you can run it until it hits, hits the end stop, and then move back a little bit. And that's a good way to sort of test every motor, make sure that it works. Mm -hmm. So your board is on the top with the capacitors, and then you have this uh, bed of nails, and that's the board, what you just showed? This is from uh, top. The okay, I see the top. nails, okay. And these nails are touching the test points on your board, correct? Exactly. And you and created so, whole mechanics and whole electronics by yourself. Yeah, yeah. So what but, was like the, what were the challenges? How did you, where did you find the mechanics, the chassis, for example? Did you buy it or? You mean this thing? Yeah. Yeah, you can buy that on AliExpress, for instance, with the plunger and everything. And then what you get is just uh, some acrylic plate here. Mm -hmm. um, and then you assemble it and uh, you have to sort of make something that um, will make it, uh, yeah, you have to sort of do the electronics by yourself. Mm -hmm. So in the acrylic, you just drill the holes for the needles or something? What I did was, well, here, um, all of these are on a PCB, so they just slot onto the PCB and mm -hmm. then are soldered in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a bit of trial and error to get this whole thing to to be in the exact right position. Um, yeah, it was a bit of work. Yeah, I think uh, ideally you would like to place the board on the top and then solder it or something like that. <laughs> something like that. I think I, I, I used one other PCB to uh, keep it in, in place a little bit mm -hmm. further and just have a spacer. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understand. So what else is on this board? You need, I guess, uh, hmm. how do you test it? So you run a script, I guess. Yeah, I have a Usually Python, Python script. Yeah. And so... And, yeah, yeah, okay, so how it works. This, um, let's see. This thing is uh, a good overview. So this is the testing jig. Um, with uh, some uh, testing equipment. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, um, a voltage meter or a DMM mm -hmm. and a, a signal generator mm -hmm. um, and a power supply mm -hmm. and uh, uh, what's it called? Um, um, <laughs> I forget. Hold on. Electronic load. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, the voltage meter is to test different voltage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have here, there's a lot of, because there's a, 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 uh, a custom PMIC that has a lot of different voltage domains. So I'm testing all of those. And the way that I've done that is also a little bit special, I guess, because I'm using, I've created this PCB which is, um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's basically a bunch of relays which are bi-stable. So that is in order to not sort of uh, affect the measurements uh, when, when they are stable. So you can run uh, a signal through it and there won't be a lot of activity going on. Mm -hmm. There won't be a lot of uh, electromagnetism going on. And you need to connect this uh, between your measurement setup and uh, your test, your board, which is used in the for the testing, yeah, with the needles. Yeah. So the whole stack up is this uh, board on the bottom, and then this is in between. Mm -hmm. This one you can reuse. I've reused it on several revisions, mm -hmm. um, but this one will probably have to change between. It, it mm -hmm. sort of is the revision of the actual PCB that you want to mm -hmm. test. So the orange one, orange one is just for routing signals or something like that. Yeah, it's pretty easy. So it's just all of these connectors are, um, you can imagine like a bunch of relays which have two states basically. 
Yeah, but so rerouting signal. So you yeah. connect the pins with together uh, with you need. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very simple interface. It's just I uh, I I square C GPIO. I square C uh, GPIO expanders. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very simple interface. It's just this connector is the only thing that can uh, sort of um, controls all of this and all of these other connectors are just passive uh relays basically mm -hmm. yeah okay i understand and okay. so this, and what is on this board yeah so this comes up here and i can use those to route signals in different ways mm -hmm. so what i've done is i've created a tree of um uh, voltage uh, uh domain testing and oh so, I can... so now i understand what you need so basically you need you have like multiple uh points for example where you need to measure voltage and exactly. you, you need to read out this to one point because you only have one device which can measure precisely the voltage yeah so okay. i have one uh um, voltage meter and then i can route the different voltages to that voltage meter mm -hmm. okay uh, i understand uh in real time or yeah uh, and so I, I can go through all of those different voltages and test are they within spec or not mm -hmm. Uh, and I also record it, and then I, I um, uh, make a, a document, which is sort of a test document that comes with every board. So all the devices uh, in your rack, they are connected through Ethernet or USB to, like, test PC, and this test PC is running the Python and reading everything? Ah, so uh, all of the test equipment is uh, old HP equipment, and it is connected with GPIB. Okay, or, I have no idea what is it, but I guess it's some kind of interface which you can connect then to your PC. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hewlett Packard interface bus. Okay. I think it is. I hope so. And then you have Python driver, which you and you can use it to read the uh, values from these devices or set yeah. them. Okay. So all of these are connected together with uh, G or HPIB, and then that is connected to Ethernet. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. Yeah, through a national instruments type of uh, bridge, and then they are all um, th that whole rack is controlled by the board itself, because this has. Oh, so you don't have like extra PC? I don't have an extra PC. No. So how do you record all these values, and where you store them? Um, so each board sort of. It, it boots up into a special Linux image that I have. And then I run the script from the board. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's so, interesting. Uh, yeah. So it tests itself in a way <laughs> and it can, it can turn on and off the, the power supply and the, um, yeah, I understand now. Interesting. Yeah. And cool. control. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. It sounds really nice when all the relays are sort of, uh, going through is like click, 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 just to test all the voltage domains. It sounds really cool. <laughs> okay. So th this itself was, I guess, a big project. Yeah, pretty big. Yeah. Uh, it was a bit of a, like a, a mind bender in initially. Like I, it's, it's sort of easy to look at it now, but it was quite a bit of work to sort of figure out how do I test all the parts of a 3d printer board? Because he's got steppers. There's a lot of mechanical stuff, you know, um, in addition to like uh, Ethernet and USB and um, uh, like all these different um, PWM things. So it all needs to be tested somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, perfect. Yeah. Uh, I think you mentioned you also built these boards by yourself, not PCBs. You or the PCBs, but you assemble them to get there. Yes, yes. So I let's ordered... talk a little bit about this because yeah. this is something what I always wish to try, but I really, I'm kind of scared of, you know, buying a machine and then spending ages trying to figure out how the software works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time just doing research on which machine to get um, because I, I'm connected to a, a makerspace and I have my office in a makerspace um, for a long time. And so 
what we decided to do was, well, actually it was a, a colleague of mine who had a project and he said, I really need to, I want to do manufacturing in-house. I think that it makes sense for this, this project. I will um, put up the money up front and then we can, if it's useful for the makerspace, then we can have the makerspace buy the machine eventually. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the budget was um, about $10,000. That's what it ended up to uh, to be for this machine, which is the one that we have now. It's uh, from small SMT. And it's a sort of a hybrid machine. So it has some CL feeders and it has some um, integration feeders, I think they call it. But so it's this is for assembly. PCB assembly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like automatic assembly. Mm -hmm. And uh, this machine next to it is for manual assembly. Mm -hmm. so sometimes you want to do um, if you have like a project that has a lot of uh, capacitors, but you only want to make two boards, maybe. So it's, um, it's, it's a good solution to have like automatic assembly plus some manual assembly. How the manual assembly works? Um, do you need to like move it by hands or? Yes. So really the only useful thing about this machine is that you have the vacuum to pick up the component mm -hmm. you have the swivel so that you can turn it um 360 degrees and so, so you use this uh, what is it like pedals or yeah honestly it's a bit overkill what i use i only use the um the um, the vacuum uh, the other pedal is actually to lock the axis in place it's not that useful to be honest it's the machine itself is a little bit it's not uh, stable enough i think to to mm -hmm. use it that way but and then where, where you hold it uh, when you are moving the component um so this is the the vacuum pump mm -hmm. then you you press the button and then it, it go yeah you <laughs> pick up the yeah then you move it into place and then mm -hmm. you put it down into the paste. So you hold it where the vacuum is or by uh, hand, you move it by hand, like. Yes, you move it by hand. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Is it like really easier than just use tweezers and solder it the, or the put problem, it there? The problem with tweezers is that they usually, um, they usually, it, it gets, um, stuck there it's hard to get it off in the oh right. yeah because yeah because that's a little bit if you are just placing components it may be a little bit different from when you are soldering them down because if you are soldering them they will stick there but if you are just placing them into paste they can like stay on the tweezers or something yeah exactly there's always something with the tweezer like uh, there, there can be magnetic residue or there can be like flux residue or something that will keep it from being released when you want it to be released. Mm -hmm. okay. but, um, yeah, but just using vacuum and a, a, a proper uh, like nozzle, um, that, uh, that makes it a lot easier. Okay, so tell me something about the bigger machines. I'm, I'm curious about this one. So can you use like short, uh, short uh, tapes for this one? Yeah, you can. You have um, you can use cut strips. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then there's just some kind of tray that you sort of slide it into. And then you have to define what is the pitch, what is the the distance between each component, and where is component zero. Mm -hmm. And then you just maneuver over that component using a camera. Mm -hmm. Once you're satisfied with that, you say, this is where the first component is. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it goes, there's a new component every two millimeters or four millimeters mm -hmm. in this direction. Basically, that's how you do that. And then, uh, how much work it is to feed it, like food, feed these, uh, holders or something. Yeah. So if you want to do cut strips, then you have maybe 20 components, uh, along the length of that. And mm -hmm. then once you've exhausted that, then you have to cut it and move it back in. Mm -hmm. Do you have like also extra, or I guess you, you can buy some extra trays, which you can pre-fill when it is assembling or I don't know. 
you can, but I think people that use the cut strip, they, um, they're not in a hurry. They're, it's not mass production. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's small batches. So usually you will have enough for several boards. Mm -hmm. I'm only thinking like if it's taking too long, is not the paste going to lose its quality or something? That's a good question. Um, it does degrade over time, um, but I have done. It, so it first of all, it depends on uh, what kind of how what what is how difficult is the board to manufacture in the first place. So if it's uh, a big pads and big components, then I'm sure it's easier to you can leave it probably overnight, even like 24 hours. I've done that, and it still seems fine. But it seems like the f the flux is evaporating, uh, and then it becomes less sticky, mm -hmm. it becomes, uh, more. Uh, oh. So, uh, I I don't know the answer to it, but it seems to degrade if you mm -hmm. leave it. If you leave it for a long time, it will harden completely. Like so, in one day, basically, ideally, you would like to put that all the components on on one side, correct? Yeah. As soon as as soon as possible. So as soon as you put paste on there, you have a few hours. Uh, well, it, it seems to be a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. So I try to be prepared when I put the paste on. Um, and then I just, yeah, I put the paste on right before I put it into the machine, basically. How do you do double-sided PCBs? Yeah, so uh, I do the side that um, has the lightweight components mm -hmm. first. Um, which is the back and uh, then I do the whole process and I put it into the oven, mm -hmm. this reflow oven from Eurocircuits. Mm -hmm. And then once the board is complete, I add paste to the other side and then do the whole process again. Okay. And because the small components are light and they will stick and they will not yeah, fall off exactly. the board, correct? Yeah. Okay. It's something that is heavy, uh, for instance, an inductor or something like that, and you have to have it on the bottom, then you have to use something like glue or something. Or you can solder it later. You can, but um, it's yeah, okay. not ideal. Okay, I understand. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, uh, what is the exact, uh, do you know what is the exact number of the machine, the assembly machine? Huh. Or maybe people will find it based on the picture. Yeah, uh, hopefully they will. Uh, so this is, this was purchased maybe in 2017 or something. So that I know that there are, there are newer models that you probably want to get if you are buying something in this price range. Mm -hmm. Because I think oh. there are also cheaper, like. Absolutely. Yeah. 500. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I would be yeah. 500 There's maybe. Everything mm -hmm. from probably a thousand dollars up to millions of dollars. Okay. Uh, yeah. What about what's about the oven? I'm curious about the oven. How much does it cost? It was do donated to the makerspace, so I don't know the price, but I think it's in the two thousand euro range or two thousand mm -hmm. range. The euro and the dollars now. How does it work? There is a. Is it hitting from top and bottom? And... It, it is infrared heating um and i think the difference between this and uh like the cheaper models is that the cheaper models so the the t9 something there's there's one that's very uh all over the place a lot of makerspaces has it uh and it's about a hundred dollars something like that but it has hot spots so mm -hmm. you can't really yeah it, 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 it is not distributed equally no not really okay so this one doesn't suffer from that so much. And here you can really program each um, each cycle. Like you have the preheat and then you have the the peak uh, and then you have the the cool down and all of that. And you can sort of, you have a graphical user interface that you can use to, to set all of these stages. How many boards you had to kind of uh, not solder properly <laughs> until you find out what profile to use? Huh. I guess it's not always like straightforward, or is it? I think you can be, I think it's pretty, 
I don't know. I, I haven't really had a problem with that. Um, you use the highest power. I... <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't do that because then you'll burn the boards or you can over, you can, you can break something. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. Okay. Uh... But this is not really the difficult part. And this is also, this is, it, it takes a long time to learn. Um, because it's it's a lot of quirks with the software and everything, and it's it's sort of a complex machine to understand. But this one is uh, really where um, this is the where you apply the paste. Mm -hmm. There's a stencil holder, mm -hmm. and if if you get the paste just exactly right, that is probably the most important step in the whole process mm -hmm. of uh, having good yield on uh, a small batch. Okay, what else do you have here? Microscope, I see microscope. Yeah, yeah, we have a mantis microscope. And then this is uh, something that I use. It's just a, a bottom heater, just a, a preheater uh, that I use to preheat the board when um, soldering connectors. Because there's um, there is a large ground plane or several large ground planes in the board. And so... Um, in order to to solder all those uh, connections, we are talking about through hole. Yes, correct? these through holes. In order to solder all of these these with a good wetting, then um, it needs some kind of preheat. Mm -hmm. So I created like a, a holder jig that will hold all the components in place, and then I can just go over with a, a good soldering iron. And then... Holder jig. So you created something which holds the connectors plug in, so you can solder them. Yeah, exactly. How did you how did you create it? Or is it like from plastic, or what did you? I, I tried to three D print it, but then it melted. <laughs> so I had to um, I had to um, CNC it out of aluminum. Mm -hmm. So it's basically something what just copies the shape of the connectors. Yes, basically. Mm -hmm. um, not sure I have a picture of it. Um, I can open, oh, not that one, but uh, FreeCAD. What kind of software the uh, assembly machine is using? Is it like difficult to learn? Um, it is a little bit difficult to learn, yeah. It, it takes a while. So there's actually a pretty good manual, but one of the reasons I chose this machine instead of um, uh, like, because this it, it's been made in China, but it's uh, sort of uh, the project is handled by a German guy. And I think that um, he, I'm not sure if he's written the manual, but he's, he oversees the, the project at least. And mm -hmm. uh, it seems that uh, the manual and the software is good compared to other similar machines. So what, what exactly is in the software? Because, you know, you generate these pick and place uh, files, but that's not really everything what you need. You need to like tell the software where each specific component is located. You need to maybe, I mean, in the feeds, for example, I don't know. Then yep. what, what do you need to do? How, what are the steps when you are setting up this machine? Well, there's basically two pages or two sort of uh, states that you're looking at one is all the all the components and the other is the actual board that you're making and uh, uh, those are the two that you have to set up but once you've set up all the components then you can reuse that part um, and so on the one side you have all of the different reels and all of the different components and then you have your um, position file which is something that you export from KiCad, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you have to match the component value to the feeder. How do you do that? Uh, you can do it automatically just based on the value. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also go in and fix it manually. Can you check it like uh, in the software if the connections are right? Or like, can it like simulate? simulate yes you can but nobody uses that okay yeah. <laughs> once you are done you just hit the start button eh? <laughs> well 
Usually when setting up a board, you go through like each component individually, and then you, you try to place it and see that it's, it matches the position. The position is right. And then you pretty much know that all the other components will be right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, so that's part of it. So, so what the machine does is, um, it goes to pick up the component and then it goes over a camera to find the center of the component. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to put it down into the paste. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, there is, you, you can spend a lot of time calibrating it, but, um, <laughs> but okay, I understand. let's go back to the, uh, uh, tool what you created it uh yeah the the tool uh, that i created yeah. hold on solder holder yeah yeah aluminum solder holder that's the one that i want yeah mm -hmm. that's it it's uh i'm not sure where the shading is so strange but um yeah that's what i was thinking how it's yeah. helping to I think there's a lot of uh, oh, there's a lot of distance stuff and fear. You spend so much time on this project. So are you going to or are you planning to sell it or what, what are your plans with this project? Yeah. yeah, it is. Let me just uh, go through this. So this is with the board uh, in there. Mm -hmm. And I then you can yeah. see that it sort of keeps all the connectors in place mm -hmm. and this whole assembly then um, goes on top of the uh, of this mm -hmm. and then you preheat it to 100 degrees or something and then it's easy to sort of solder all the all the connections otherwise it's it's really time consuming and it doesn't become as nice so it's one way to get nice uh, through hole connectors um, without having selective reflow um, solder. But that would be the dream to have a, so, uh, I'm sorry, selective wave solder. That would be the dream. The, the dream. <laughs> okay. So I ask, what are your plans with this board? Well, because now it's spent um, so much time with it. Yeah. Um, it's to sell it to whoever wants to buy it. Um, so it's, um, it's for it's it's for end users, but it's also for three um, D printer manufacturers, and so they can, uh, if you want to make a high end printer, then uh, um, it's nice to have a finished board that is tested and is working, and uh, you don't have to do everything from scratch and re reinvent the wheel, mm -hmm. because it, it is a lot of work. And so, like I said, I started this in. Um, 2019 this board and it's now at revision a6 so seven different type of revisions and um just doing that from scratch finding somebody who can do it and getting it the job done it is uh time consuming and uh, expensive so, so why did you do it well i i love uh, 3d printers i think they're uh, really interesting because they are they have a lot of things that I like. <laughs> like it's very, it's very physics based, you know? It's a, a physical system that is controlled with software and there's electronics and there's um, a mechanical part and there's a lot of math and there's software and there's um, a combination of everything that I think is interesting and that I know a lot about. So um, that's why I ask because I think you really like had to enjoy working on this project, uh, yes. not only like thinking about money, but you actually like really like to build it and, and see how it goes and maybe discover all the new things and learn new skills or something. I guess that's yeah. why you did it. Exactly. There's a, there's a lot of things to learn and it's, it's, a it's a big undertaking. Um, and there's still things to learn. And so I haven't gotten tired of it yet. <laughs> Hopefully I'll have, have you seen like, uh, 
Because sometimes, you know, I very often say, um, tell people to work on their own projects because, for example, it can help them even like get a job or something. Yeah. So have you been like contacted uh, by some companies based on this project what you are building or or you never like really shared this project like too much so not many people really know about it? Well, uh, I haven't been uh, typecast, <laughs> if that uh, is <laughs> what you mean, uh, or pigeonholed. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I, I used the project as a um, like a, a big milestone that has everything. So if I do consultancy, for instance, mm -hmm. if I show somebody this project, then they realize that it's probably much more complex than, than what they need. Time. Yeah, probably. So it's, it's nice. kind of reference. So, yeah, it's a reference. Mm -hmm. Good. What we haven't talked about is uh, the rest of the, or the, the the top line here, which is um, display uh, and that screen. Yeah, manga screens. But we can we can save that for another time. <laughs> it's a whole episode in itself. <laughs> so you designed also that pad by yourself. The, or, or are you the, are you buying something? What is? Well, I can talk about that uh, later, but uh, basically this is the result of two different Kickstarters, these uh, displays. So it was Manga Screen 1 and Manga Screen 2. And um, it's basically a small, it's a cell phone display. So it's uh, it's the same thing that is used in a cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, and then I added the electronics or the logic to make it HDMI compatible. Wow. And these are your Kickstarter projects? Yes. Can we have a look? <laughs> I'm always curious about right. Kickstarter project because uh, I think they are like super hard to do actually properly because I don't know how I would do it and I would be scared like no one would buy the things or back up the project. Yeah, so this is the, the Kickstarter. Uh, and it was successful quite a while ago. Yeah, 2018. Uh, I uh, think we uh, when we divide it by 10, that's how much uh, it is in the US dollars approximately. Oh, yes, uh, divided by 10. Okay, so for $60,000. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so that was enough to manufacture a thousand boards, at least of the big one, and then I think 500 of the smaller one. How did you find 583 bakers? I don't know. I don't know how they, how they, how they found this. I think actually a lot of them came from Kickstarter mm -hmm. and initially at least. So Kickstarter, it's, it's, is it, it's a whole thing in itself, you know, it's a whole thing to learn in itself. Um, but, um, I guess, uh, Basically, you need to have an email list and it, the project needs to be interesting enough to get a lot of backers initially um, so that in the first few days, like first three days, it needs to get up to ideally 100% mm -hmm. and then sort of go from there. But there's a big, like the, the curve goes like way up and then it flattens mm -hmm. off. And then it goes up a little bit more towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's important to get that initial interest from mm -hmm. um, everybody so that people will think that, oh, this is a project that has a lot of wind in the sails and uh, uh, it's something that I want to be a part of. I think that's important. To... Is there some kind of algorithm in Kickstarter, like on YouTube, for example, like uh, it will some kind of show these popular projects uh, on the top or something like that? They might have changed it, but I know that there is a staff that goes through uh, the projects and they, they do like a staff pick and they, they put some projects on the front page and all that, but I think it's more manual than mm -hmm. YouTube. Okay. How much work is it to prepare Kickstarter project? It uh, can be quite a bit of work. Um, just taking pictures and writing the text and stuff, maybe three, two, three days. Um, but doing the video, which should be like the most important thing. So I was really lucky. I got a good friend called Kuka 
he made he, he was an amazing videographer and he made this uh, video for me just as a, a friend uh, or a favor to a friend and uh, I think that was really important to get uh, get as much traction mm -hmm. as it so uh, and once you finish this uh, Kickstarter you had to deliver correct yeah and there was a like that is that is part of it like you can do a kickstarter and then you can get the money that you need but then you have maybe several months usually to um get it manufactured and everything and there's a lot of hurdles <laughs> there's a lot of examples of people who have not been able to deliver and um like if you have priced the project wrong then you can easily run into um a situation where you we you run out of money or yeah. Uh, yeah it's easy to to make mistakes uh, even so how difficult it was to like build this like i don't know 600 well i didn't manu manufacture it it was done by somebody else but mm -hmm. it was a lot of work to just uh have the prototypes sort of um making it all work as a functional product yeah, you know, just making it sort of work as a smooth, nice thing, you know. Um, I'm not sure how much you can see from this, um, but on the back, yeah, there's a there's a PCB, and then there's an injection molded, mm -hmm. pump, and then there's a an LCD, and there's a touch panel on top of that. Mm -hmm. and that the touch panel needs to be bonded optically to the LCD. Mm -hmm. So there's a maybe three or four different uh, manufacturers involved uh, and yeah, so it's it's quite complex so it is yeah. I'm, I'm i'm very surprised well done like yeah it was a lot of work and uh i haven't been able to sort of keep the the project going unfortunately because um it requires a lot of uh work or it, it re requires a thousand units that's the moq for the the bonding process mm -hmm. so that a lot of upfront um, uh, funding, so it was. I was able to do it through the Kickstarter, but uh, I haven't been able to do the same thing. Um, just uh, funding it uh, personally, mm -hmm. because there is not like enough margin and enough. Like you would have to manufacture, let's say, as you say, like thousand pieces, and then you would need to sell them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but still, well done. I think these are like super hard things to do, Kickstarter. But yeah. I'm always interested to know uh, stories of different people, how they went through this. Yeah, so when this, this was Manga Screen 2, which is, was, um, it was a lot of work because it was um, a chip that used sort of uh, HDMI on the input and then DSI on the output. And that was a protocol that I had not worked with before. It's a uh, display serial interface. It's what all cell phones use. And I think some tablets as well. Um, but it's a very industry standard. It's difficult to find the documentation of how it works. And um, it is a very high data rate protocol so it's um difficult to probe it with a <laughs> um, scope yeah and as a small manufacturer you won't i didn't get uh, uh toshiba's attention mm -hmm. they didn't give me like the the data sheet uh or the support anything. what you would need yeah it was a very sparse data sheet and so i had to sort of uh, really spend a lot of time getting to that first image uh, and sh sort of showing that image. Um, it was several months actually of sort of hacking and figuring stuff out and uh, looking at the drivers, for instance, um, all that. Yeah. So what did you learn from this project and from running Kickstarter? Manufacturing is hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um... Calculate your product price correctly yeah i think that <laughs> it was not priced right or how do i say this like the price was i think it was about 99 dollars, something like that for uh for the, the the display 
And then manufacturing costs, even though I had sort of calculated it to be $45 or something, mm-hmm. it up and it was, it's expensive to make something in a fairly small volume. But still, still better than if you would have to pay 150 <laughs> for manufacturing. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure how, how much the earning in the end was, but um, it was, I think it's a nice product and I want it to be out there. I wish I could make more and I want to make more, but um, I need to uh, uh, fund it somehow. So, Okay. So what did you learn from this? I interrupted you. I, I, I just told you my, oh, <laughs> my what thing. What I learned from this? Um, you know, when I'm asking this because... Uh, I'm sure many people are thinking about designing their own boards and selling there. And and I think there are always lessons to learn once you design a product, uh, then that's not the end. That's actually the beginning of the journey. So that's why I'm asking you. Well, I guess um, uh, hacking is easy, but getting something stable is, uh, it requires like a, a different way of working. It's uh, like a really tedious process. And just when the Kickstarter is done, that's when the main work starts because then you have maybe six months to a year to actually complete the product and um, and deliver maybe a thousand units or, or more, you know, to to a lot of people. And there's a lot of logistics involved and the, not all of it is fun. So, um, is it stressful? Yeah, it can be because usually there will be delays and it is, uh, it's, it's stressful to try and make content that is negative. Like it's, um, you have bad news and you have to tell the backers that have already paid for the product Mm -hmm. that there's going to be delays. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that uh, people on Kickstarter are pretty used to things being Mm -hmm. delayed, but not everybody. And, Mm -hmm. uh, like you can get quite a bit of, um, negative feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you are, if you're aware of this and you're able to uh, do updates along the way, then, um, yeah, most people are, um, like they, as long as you sort of give people feedback, like there's going to be a delay and you you show progress all, uh, all along, along the way. And people are, um, um, well, they want you to succeed, you know, they want the product and they want to share the journey. I think, um, at least that's what I've heard. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, So what is your like daily job? Um, so this is, I, I work on this latest product record as much as possible. Um, but it's sort of the, the, the product is more or less done. I want to do stuff with software, but there's not a lot of hardware changes anymore. Um, so I have to transition into going to trade shows and um, conferences and trying to uh, talk to people and um, try. That's to how we it. met. Exactly. So you yeah. are doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hopefully this will help. And then, yeah. <laughs> But it's going to be interesting because um, um, I haven't really been able to talk to the 3D printer manufacturers since a long time ago, several years. So I, I'm trying to get back into that whole line of thinking and uh, um, pushing the product out there instead of just being in the office, uh, creating something that I think people want, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm. So I, I, I wish you like good luck with this because I know how, how hard it is to actually design something, make it happen and then sell it. And uh, that's all for this video. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much to Elias for finding time to help me to create this video. Thank you Elias. And if you have any questions about how 3D printers work, how to design electronics for them, how to write software to control these boards, leave your comments under this video. If you like this video, don't forget to press the like button. And if you would like to see future videos with different guests on this channel, then subscribe. 
Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye.